Good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Paul Skinner, founder of Marketing Kind, and welcome to this Marketing Kind exchange in which we'll be exploring how we might still find hope amid the climate emergency. We could hardly be in better company to do so because we are joined this evening by one of our most prominent environmental writers, broadcasters and campaigners, and someone who I find it very uplifting to listen to, even when the message is stark, Sir Jonathan Horrit. Um, Jonathan has written 11 books, and the most recent of these is the most relevant to this evening's conversation. It is Hope in Hell, a decade to confront the climate emergency. The actress and campaigner Joanna Lumley has very memorably talked about Jonathan's book, saying that we teeter like the coach at the end of the Italian job on the brink of irreversible disaster, that it might seem impossible to pull back from that peril, but that Jonathan's book shows us how it can be done. Um, Jonathan is perhaps uh, best known to many of our members for having founded Forum for the Future, which is still the UK's leading sustainable development charity, um, still has over 70 members of staff and currently has over 100 corporate partnerships, which by my uh, rudimentary calculations suggests a very high level of productivity per member of staff. Um, other roles that Jonathan has currently include being president of Population Matters, president of the Conservation Volunteers and director of Collectively, uh, and of course, his prior roles include being director of Friends of the Earth. He was co-chair of the Green Party, a trustee of the World Wildlife Fund. Um, and he's also a former chair of the UK Sustainable Development Commission. Um, funnily enough, the second former chair of the Sustainable Development Commission to have joined us at Marketing Kind, because we also had the good fortune, of course, of doing an exchange with uh, Professor Tim Jackson. Um, along with Tim Smith and Dan uh, Sir Tim Smith and Daniela Barone Suarez, uh, that people may remember well. Um, he's also invested heavily in future generations and has been Chancellor of Keel University since February 2012 and received a CBE for services to environmental protection. Welcome to Marketing Kind, Jonathan. How are you feeling this evening? Okay. <laughs> Um, I, I'm actually in Suffolk at the moment. I'm campaigning for the Green Party candidate in Suffolk in a new constituency called Waveney Valley. And being back on the campaign trail is actually quite good fun. And there's lots of support. I mean, the weird thing is the Greens could actually win here. And um, I've not been able to say that very often in my political life, apart from visiting Caroline in Brighton, of course, where the wonderful Caroline could always win and would win. But uh, this is well, this is a slightly different kind of um, trail that has to be beaten here, which is good. Really interesting. Well, it's nice if from time to time it's not about the taking part; it's about the the winning. Um, <laughs> exactly. We're going to pick up the thread from from this um, powerful book. Um, funnily enough, um, your book launch was on my birthday in twenty twenty. Mm. Um, perhaps of somewhat greater so, so sort of societal significance it was also in the deepest heart of lockdown you know for the disbenefit of anyone who can see the the video feed i'm showing a photo of exactly how feral uh, i had become at the time and you know we can think back to that time and you know for some of us we were lucky enough to have a bit more access to nature during during that period nearly four years ago and that can seem like a somewhat distant memory. Um, since then, um, global average land temperatures, global sea temperatures have risen faster than the modeling uh, predicts. Uh, scientists don't even fully understand why. Uh, the ice melt in Greenland and Ant Antarctica has now reached a level where it's shifting the balance of weight around the globe and the world is literally spinning at a slightly different rate on its axis thanks to the climate emergency with implications even for for timekeeping um so with 
four, nearly four years gone of the decade to uh, confront the climate emergency and just six years of it left. How would your message change today? Yes, well, um, unfortunately, the bits of hope in hell would have to be updated from the point of view of where the science tells us we now are. Those three chapters would all have to be rewritten pretty dramatically. Um, there's no question that we're now seeing the frequency and intensity of these climate-induced disasters reach a new high. Most climate scientists are running out of language to describe what is going on. Um, one, one of the scientists I have most time for is a wonderful US scientist, very modest, very kind of conservative usually in what he says, a guy called Zeke Hausfather. Um, I'm sure I've started following him just because of his name. But Zeke Hausfather was so utterly, utterly astonished by the off the charts increase in average surf surface ocean temperatures at the end of last year in November, that <laughs> he described it as absolutely gobsmackingly bananas. Now this is not normal scientific language and it's fascinating for me to see how the discourse has changed. I mean, the scient scientific community is, is actually collectively in shock that this is, although you'll still hear an occasional scientist saying, oh, we modeled this. It was all in the models, et cetera, et cetera. This is, this is just genuinely not true. Um, and so for many people who've been trying to bring the attention of politicians to bear on what these changes uh, imply for the future of humankind, it's a really difficult period. So those chapters of the book, uh, Paul, they'd have to be fairly comprehensively rewritten. <laughs> um, the hope factor would diminish a little bit. Uh, the hellishness of the world in flames would uh, increase a little bit. The six years to go out of the decade just makes everything that much more urgent and pressing, that's for sure. Yeah, it's, um, it's sort of almost feels like a Dante. There are sort of there's hell and then there's a, a, a greater hell is available if you wait a couple of years of insufficient action to, to find it. Um, but kind of just dwelling a little bit longer on you know what we learned from the pandemic and and thinking back to that the in the preface to the second edition uh you wrote that the pandemic was a chance to rethink our basic values and even our core ultimate purpose as human beings and i, I wonder to what degree is your overall message in the book and and today to what degree is it a story of environmentalism you know i described you as an environmental writer and broadcaster at the start or, or to what degree um is it a story of putting human well-being back at the heart of how we organize ourselves in society and around the world i've never called myself an environmentalist i did i honestly wasn't going to tick you off paul for calling me an environmentalist because i can't get away from it and um and indeed, uh, this week while I've been up in Suffolk, I noticed that the title has changed a bit. Now I'm now a veteran environmentalist, should you wish to extend the nature of your introduction. Um, and I've never, I've never been that. I didn't join the Green Party in 1974, which was then called the Ecology Party, because my primary concern in life at that time was to do with the physical environment, the natural world, biodiversity disappearing species. My primary concern has always been from 1974 onwards what is happening to the human race, what we need to do to ensure minimum conditions for the um, good lives for 8 billion people today, obviously significantly less in 1974, 3 billion less actually back in 1974. Um, and it's always been social justice that has made my commitment to sustainable development what it is. So that's why sustainable development is my bag, not environment per se. I'm pretty passionate about biodiversity and the natural world. That's why I was a trustee of WWF for 15 years uh, and all that matters to me. But without the social justice bit, all of that green stuff is, is uh, just an escape from reality. I want to dive into that social justice a, li a little more, more deeply for a moment. Um, in a sense, you know, hope is an important part of well-being. You know, the research shows that you know, if you don't have hope, you have increased likelihood of mortality, poorer health, 
um, diminished propensity to avoid risky behaviors. You know, we tend to find it hard to invest in our own um, future. And we actually become more vulnerable to misinformation and to exploitation when, when we lack hope. Um, just as there are powerful inequalities of wealth, there are, of course, also powerful inequalities of well-being. Um, and although there isn't a, a one for one, you know, typically people who are exposed to much harsher living situations have lower well-being on average and, and, and by a large. And, and of course, that means that there is also a, a sort of profound inequalities of hope. Now, a, a lot of the, the message of something like Hope in Hell is, of course, for you know what you might think of as important people with large responsibilities and a lot of power to make significant decisions um how do we make that story of hope as inclusive as possible how do we make it something that you know everyone can really feel can be a part of how they make their own life better and each other's lives better uh. Yeah, well, I'm not going to give up on hope, um, obviously, for all the reasons you just said, for my own personal well-being, let alone anything else, Paul. Um, but I am considerably more ambivalent about the ways in which the hope imperative is being used now by politicians, by businesses, by marketeers, if I may say so, as a necessary ingredient of whatever transformation we need to undertake. The idea that this is uh, doable without that hanging on to hope is, is sort of considered to be extraordinary. But I'm, I'm very clear about this and, and I'm not popular because of it, but hope that is not grounded in truth is a massive illusion. And in fact, it turns into a very cruel deceit. It turns into a, a trap for people. And I'm obviously thought, thinking here about when Extinction Rebellion first entered our lives in 2018. You've probably forgotten, I was reminded of it the other day, but it had three demands. And the first of those demands was tell the truth. And everybody thought, well, what? what's that got to do with anything? And of course, what they were suggesting quite um, quite powerfully was that most politicians never tell the truth about the state of the planet, never tell the truth about climate change, never tell the truth about the state of pollution and the impact of people's health and the planet from all of that pollution and so on. So tell the truth sounds like a really simple uh, recipe um, for some kind of action of that kind for Extinction Rebellion. But honestly, most people today still don't tell the truth. They don't tell the truth. I don't know a single business leader today, and we're now meant to be living in a world where we've got dozens of business leaders who would lay claim to some kind of status because of the sustainability commitments of their companies. Although quite a lot of that's going backwards at the moment, by the way, we might want to come back to that, but that's another matter. Um, politicians never tell the truth about climate change because they're all persuaded that people can only listen to so much of this stuff before they turn off. The BBC systematically refuses to let the truth be a regular part of its coverage of climate change. And I can tell you this for absolutely guaranteed truth. Editors in the BBC now issue instructions to their journalists that they can talk about what is really seriously going wrong with the climate change, but they have to end with an upbeat story. That is an editorial mandate inside the BBC, that every single time you show some disaster story going on with the climate, you've got to come out of it to give our viewers a little sense of hope in the face of all of this massive adversity. So give them a little anecdote about something going on. Mm -hmm. So and that is an editorial mandate. So for me, I'm getting quite sarky about people telling me that hope is a mandatory part of effecting genuine radical transformation in society. If that hope is not grounded in, in reality, it's a lie and the person who's promoting that kind of hope or hopium, as it is sometimes called, is doing themselves and the people listening to them no favors whatsoever. Now that might piss off a lot of people, but really and truly, as Greta Thunberg continues to remind us, to retain hope is a privilege. 
And if you want to be a beneficiary of that privilege, you have to take the actions required to justify whatever hope you might have. Yeah, I want to, to get on to the, the topic of the dangers of false hope and the dangers of ignoring the realities that we know we will have to contend with in, in our conversation. But since you've zoned in so heavily on, on truth, um, let's take a couple of moments to explore that further. As it happens, we have one of these events in person in July coming up on the theme uh, of how we can Im Im improve the truthfulness of public discourse on the climate emergency with Mike Berners-Lee, um, the environmentalist, I think he will allow me to say that, um, uh, and Lord Deben, who of course chaired the um, the, the UK's Climate Change uh, Committee and both have powerful things to say. W what kind of solutions would you put to them in terms of how we bring about a, the greater truthfulness that, that you would like to see us embrace? I don't think telling the truth preempts anything to do with giving people more hopeful ways of looking at the world, both practically and philosophically. It's just the foundation. If you can't do that as the foundation, then you've got nothing to offer people in terms of the realistic solutions that are available to us. That, so for me, it's, it's, these are not either or. I, I can't do the advocacy work I do without telling people how bad things are, because otherwise I feel I'm selling them short. But I don't spend too long on that. If I'm, if you were, if, for instance, Paul, if we were listening to a 40 minute talk from Jonathan Porritt this evening on the state of the climate today, you might get 10 minutes of me dunking you deep into the physical reality of what is happening. And the rest, I hope, would then turn to what we need to do about that. Mm -hmm. um, and that, that, I think, allows one to bridge out of uh, often quite painful reality into prospects for addressing that reality um, in the way that we need to. That's the only way I can do it. So this is a, a personal thing for me. And when I hear people equivocating about the climate science, I do get, I get, yeah, quite angsty. Yeah, the psychologists have a, a notion of narrative competence. Um, and I think it's usually deployed in things like child development. It doesn't describe our ability to tell a story. It's more fundamentally, hmm. can, can we read the room? Can we understand what other people might be thinking? Can we cooperate with the people around us? And can we forge solutions together that are appropriate to the circumstances we're in? Um, and it strikes me that on climate, alongside other issues like migration and asylum, Actually, our big problem is a societal failure of narrative competence. I mean, the similarly, you know, I think four or five Home Secretaries have lined up to tell um, Laura Coombsberg that you can't tell the truth on migration. Um, and so there does seem to be an issue where if we could perceive the truth, there are ways of cooperating, even on the climate emergency, that ultimately will increase rather than reduce our prosperity and, and well-being. So is it a sort of failure of collective narrative competence? And where is the, the pinch point? Is it the polarization of social media? Is it political structures? Where are our narratives going wrong? Because there is a narrative that is hopeful, that is real and accessible, but it, it doesn't seem to be the prevalent one. Yeah. Just a small point, there is no um, legitimate approach to addressing the climate crisis that will enhance the material standard of living of people living in the rich world. Absolutely none. We might end up with a higher quality of life, with a, a better approach to the balance between um, wealth and well-being, etc., etc. But the idea that there's a sort of future where already already very privileged lives, relatively speaking, in the rich world can go on getting richer proportionately every year through an increase in GDP, that's a total deception. It cannot happen. Can we tell a narrative that shows how people's lives will be improved? Yes, of course. And that's one of the things that we all have to do. So I'll just give you a tiny example, Paul. I heard um, yesterday, sort of, interesting stuff you probably 
know that as you wander around talking to people about climate change, one of the very successful things that the Conservatives have done, which is why they got ticked off so strongly by Chris Stark as he stood down from his role at the Committee on Climate Change, one of the things they've done is to let it be known, mostly through the Tory press, that addressing the climate emergency means that everybody's lives will become worse because everything will be more expensive. And they've been very, very successful in selling in that duplicitous narrative, very successful. So what I heard um, with the latest data that came out via, of course, um, Desnes, the government's own department, because civil servants still have a residual obligation to tell something resembling the truth when ministers let them. But the news that came out then was looking at the first quarter of electricity consumption here in the UK, so January to March, where renewables contributed 48% of the total electricity mix in the UK. And this had led to a 22% reduction in wholesale electricity prices, which, as was quite rightly commented on by the um, FT, will lead to a significant downward pressure on prices. So when you think about this stuff, we're just being outplayed when it comes to narratives about all of this. The devil has often had the best tunes, and when your devil has all sorts of trumpeteers and amplifiers like the Daily Mail and the Daily Telegraph and all the rest of the wretched bunch of right-wing media in this country, then clearly the devil can play those tunes regardless of what the truth is. But for me, I am very focused when I tell the narrative about climate change, if we address it in the way that we need to, which is to start with energy efficiency, to start with improving the housing stock in this country, to start with eliminating fuel poverty, to start then with renewables, take it in that order, then the quality of people's lives will be massively enhanced. The amount of money that the NHS has to spend every year on people living in appalling housing with grotesque levels of mold and cold and all the rest of it. And what we can do just simply through eliminating some of the problems caused by air pollution today, possible net reduction every year in the, in, in the burden of health for the NHS, somewhere between eight and 12 billion pounds a year, just by sorting out those things. So I always start there. I start with the story about how people's lives will be improved as a consequence of doing what we need to do for climate. And I might eventually get on to saying how helpful that will be in terms of net zero or any of those other mm -hmm. familiar bits of verbiage, but it's not necessary. I don't always go there. I might just say, we need to do this because at the moment, really and truly, it's absolutely wicked that so many people in this rich country of ours live in conditions of chronic fuel poverty. It's wicked. So start there. I wish, I wish the Labour Party could listen to this occasion because will they start there? No, they won't. They'll just start somewhere else. Well, uh, actually, I was going to ask a little about that um, because you, you talked about the, you said that realistically the right solutions will not be based on improving the materiality, you know, of, of life in, in developed countries, you know, even if life overall may. Well, uh, I have to be careful here. Material standard of living as on year on year increases in per capita wealth in the rich world. Yeah. Now, as it happens, of course, uh, it's becoming increasingly difficult to grow GDP anyway. I mean, the IMF has talked about the tepid 20s. Um, and although there is some economic optimism about, you know, the, the coming months or, or year or so with um, uh, falling um, inflation and interest rates, actually, a lot of people believe it's going to be quite difficult, particularly, of course, in developed economies to achieve significant growth in the coming years. Um, does that mean actually that in some ways, I mean, I was, I was listening to Sadiq Khan yesterday since you you, you raised, um, he was of course a, a particular victim of the way that the yeah. conservatives have talked about climate issues with regards to his EULA's uh, uh, initiative. In, um, and he said that actually there is a space still in politics to for politicians to lead opinion rather than just follow it and that you can take higher ground is there an opportunity to 
position action on climate as being part of an approach to enhancing human well-being at scale in a way that provides an answer to politicians who actually, if they ask to be judged on economic growth, are going to fall short of the mark anyway, because it is just so difficult to achieve. There absolutely is. Absolutely. And that's what we should be doing. And that's where our narrative should be going. And, and when I, I'm, I'm sort of slightly ticked off with people who describe themselves as stubborn optimists and, um, you know, what's the other word? Oh, solutionists. Oh, God, I can't bear yeah, that stuff. Um, and I think to myself, yes, of course, don't be stubbornly optimistic about the prospects of us avoiding all pain through the climate emergency. We are now locked into a pattern of traumatic disruption as a consequence of the, of the warming we've already caused. We can mitigate the trauma associated with that level of pain, and we can do so in a way that enhances, above all, the rights and interests of poorer people in the world today. We can do all of that. So for me, pitching it in those terms, Paul, makes a great deal of sense. Politically, it's difficult to do that, but that is absolutely what we have to do. Uh, now, you've had such a career where you've been able to look at how you achieve change with, um, I was going to say a front row seat, but it's not a front row seat when you're in the ring. <laughs> um, and so you've been at the centre of achieving change as a campaigner, you've been the centre of, you know, achieving change, advising government, you've set up Forum for the Future, you've achieved change by advising businesses. Um, to what degree has, has your career been about you consciously deciding that actually maybe this is the more powerful leverage point or that is the more powerful leverage point? Or to what degree has it been just that you've been given these various opportunities and pursued them and you know what what's your sense of how the key leverage points of change have themselves changed over time and what what can we learn from that as people who would like to achieve more change than we do yes well there's a fairly stark choice here paul some people are and organizations are totally wedded to nailing their theory of change and being as applied and logical as they can possibly be and thinking about leverage points, audiences, assets, opportunities, risks, et cetera, and drilling all of that data about what they and their organization can do to achieve something in the world and drilling it and refining it into this thing called the theory of change. And I have to say, I've shared quite a lot of time with my colleagues in Forum for the Future honing and re-honing our theory of change, depending on which sort of particular mood was prevalent at the time. And as a huge climate uh, theory of change skeptic, just telling people to relax. So I am, a, I am a theory of change skeptic, and that's largely because the decisions I've taken have been driven more by intuition and by um, need than by, by a supremely logical um, theory of change process. So the reason why I set up Forum for the Future and why I was co-founder of the um, Prince of Wales Business and Sustainability Programme was that I just finished 15 years um, working with um, the Green Party and Friends of the Earth. And it was, uh, it was exhausting. I mean, the, the campaigning tactics of Friends of the Earth were unremitting. Basically, the whole psychological palette that we played with revolved around making people feel guilty, uh, making people feel angry about what was happening, and basically causing them to rethink their entire life and making them feel bad about themselves. So I worked through that emotional story in the Green Party and Friends of the Earth, and I couldn't do it anymore. I was kind of, I'd run out of room with the the finger of blame, as it were. So when I came back from the Earth Summit in 1992, the thing I really wanted to do was to find ways of, of turning the positive energy that I discovered in Rio in 1992 into something that would give a great deal more empowerment to people in their organizations to take forward uh, positive changes of this kind. And that's what has sustained me 
pretty much through that time for the last 30 years. We set up the forum in 1994, 1996. Um, but I'm coming out of that now. I, I've sort of, and the reason I'm coming out of it is because I, I'm more skeptical about corporate sustainability than I've been before. I don't honestly think it's making the kind of difference that some people claim it's making. Um, and we might want to discuss that, but it's not what moves me now. Um, and I, I, I had a session the other day with a, a wonderful friend of mine who's just set up a new initiative called the Climate Majority Project, which is stop talking to small numbers of activists, Jonathan, and get your head around how to persuade the majority of people this is something they need to do. And I said, that's not where I am. I, I, look, I really admire what you're doing and I'm gonna support you, but it's not where I am. And he said to me, so you're supporting organizations like Just Stop Oil and Extinction Rebellion and Fossil Free uh, London and New Green Deal Rising and all this. So that's where your energy is going at the moment. What's your theory of change for those organizations, Jonathan? I said, I don't care. I don't care. I know these organizations alienate and piss off a lot of people. Mm -hmm. But my reason for supporting them has nothing to do, literally nothing to do with whether or not they're likely to be successful. It has everything to do with this sense of deep rage that I feel about how our generation is now literally suppressing prospects for the next generation and making their lives in the future increasingly untenable and for me that's a, that's a I don't want this to sound too sanctimonious but it is a kind of moral thing that overrides any theory of change stuff and it's what makes me and that's where I get my energy from I don't get my energy from beautifully crafted theories of change most of which I think are probably as about as relevant for as long as it takes you to produce one interesting the the um you talked about uh rage um you know we often don't it's interesting at the start i said you're somebody i find it uplifting to listen to even when the message is stark and i think there is something about the particular anger that that you're able to cultivate that you are able to deploy it in a way that somehow uplifts people into action <laughs> Um, which is not a, an easy thing to pull off. I want to get on to what is really motivating you and some of the things you said in the book, but as you have had such a remarkable experience with Forum for the Future, and as so many of our members are working with businesses to try yeah. to yeah, yeah. The, the needle, can we just focus on that for a moment first? You know, what, what should we be learning uh, from your experience at Forum for the Future with how you can bring about change? Because Forum for the Future has partnered with you know, massive global mm. businesses. Um, where do we need to get better at effecting that kind of change? And where is the balance when you're working in a capacity such as through Forum for the Future uh, between you know, supporting businesses in a way that they are comfortable with and are ready to sign up to, uh, which, you know, any consultancy might do, but then actually stimulating a greater level of change than, than, than the leaders of that business were previously emotionally and intellectually ready to contemplate. Mm, yeah. Yeah, don't get me wrong, Paul, I'm not saying that, um, corporate sustainability and the idea of embedding a much deeper, more profound sense of purpose in companies. I'm not saying those things are irrelevant. They are still absolutely crucial because we will not be able to um, achieve the transformation that we're talking about unless we can bring the voice of business and the private sector into that challenge. So it's still a really important part of the total picture. It's just not my part any longer but it is definitely a critical part of that process but i think that when you confront how hard it is for companies actually to move the needle as you put it that's because the even the best companies in the world don't make the rules of the game the rules of the game are made by governments and if governments choose to keep the rules of the game where they are now which is fundamentally in the business of destroying life on earth rather than nurturing life on earth then it's very very hard for companies to do what they need to do uh, it's very top of my mind at the moment, but I've worked with Unilever since 1997. 
Unilever has a new chief executive, a guy called Heinz Schumacher. He's recently been impressed having um, admitted to Bloomberg News that he was rowing back on the sustainability targets inside Unilever. And I won't go into my reactions to that because that would not be uh, sufficiently discreet. But you, all I could hear him, I could hear this sort of sense of agony in his voice as he said this, because Unilever appointed some activist investors onto the board and those activist investors basically said, Unilever's underperforming in terms of everything we expect, which is margin, dividend, market share, et cetera, et cetera. Get your act together. If that means you have to go slow on this sustainability stuff, then go slow. So one simple example of this, Unilever's biggest source of pollution in the world today, the little sachets, plastic sachets that they use across the whole of Southeast Asia and India, and um, less so in, in developed world countries, but nonetheless, and they produce billions and billions of these sachets every year. And they had a commitment to phase out the um, impact of these sachets by finding different packaging formats by 2025. Um, Heinz Schumacher has now extended that date to 2035. So that's another decade of billions and billions of these wretched plastic sachets littering the environment in country after country. And I'm sure that his activist and shares on the uh, uh, activist investors on his board think, yay, mm -hmm. terrific, because we won't have to incur any additional costs associated with getting out of those sachets into what they know would be the proper alternatives. So we're still wrestling with that. Um, and, and it's best not to be naive about that. The, 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 the rules of the game, the capitalist economy as it exists today, are very harsh. And when you have leadership teams in businesses that really care about this, they feel some of that pain. Don't get me wrong, I've, been, I've sat with executive teams in companies who've hit the, hit the threshold where they can't go and do what they need to do. And they feel that they're betraying themselves and betraying what it is they would like their company to stand for, but the pressure from a shareholder first model of capitalism is so remorseless that they just can't deliver against that. But again, it's avoiding naivety. And sometimes you can get around that by collaboration, companies coming together to actually achieve a bigger outcome than they can achieve on their own, even big companies like Unilever. Yeah, it's interesting. The, um apparently you can tell what a generation is likely to be like by the economic conditions uh, at the time when they first enter the workplace and in a sense maybe uh, the sort of um, mind <laughs> what people have as an idea as how Jonathan Parrott works might depend on how old they were when they first engaged you so I perhaps mm. first came to you through you know capitalism as if the the world matters oh wow okay. um and uh i i wonder to because what i want to get on but just while we're dwelling on forum and engaging with businesses um you know in a sense in recent decades of shareholder capitalism the outlook of businesses has become rather narrow you know a lot of going a little bit further back in time a lot of big businesses were founded with a vision of the kind of lives they might create for employees and so on and a, a more all-encompassing view but businesses have become a little narrow in focus and so in a sense is there a risk that you know businesses have maybe done okay on things like uh phased reduction of emissions because the numbers game that they play is quite similar to the kind of numbers games that they're used to playing yeah. anyway uh, whereas the broader vision of well how do you create a company that's regenerative in the first place yeah. um it is sort of beyond the scope of that narrow focus of vision is there a, a way to overcome that obstacle i don't think so personally because i uh, i'm of the view that we can't harness the true creative power of business. This is paradoxical. Unless and until governments mandate the changes mm -hmm. that are required. Yeah. So I we've done some calculations like a lot of other um, you know, advisors in this space, looking at what would happen if you had a mandatory cost of carbon. Yeah. So instead of an internal cost of carbon, all this kind of stuff, say that 
that uh, governments indicated that from 2025 onwards, the price of a ton of carbon would start at $100 a ton. And by the time we got to 2030, it would be $250, $300 a ton, and it will be paid across the entire economy. No exceptions, no opportunities to game the system. Everybody would have to pay. Total transformation, mm. because that then is a very different kind of level playing field. <laughs> it's a level playing field where one of the externalities that allows some companies to create illegitimate profit, one of those externalities disappeared because they can't dump that cost onto the environment and future generations. And everybody has to do it. So nobody loses out in terms of relative competitiveness. Um, can companies do a good job without that voluntarily? Well, you look at the you look at the pain that's going on with the net zero debate at the moment, net zero by 2050, you look at what's happening with science-based targets, you look at the dispute and the controversy around offsetting, all of this kind of stuff. It is, in my opinion, incredibly hard to do this voluntarily. I've been a bit mean about Unilever, to be fair to Unilever, they're sticking to their guns with their net zero commitment by 2039, and it's, and it's for real. I mean, I've seen the, you know, the detailed workings of that and it's painful for a company to do that at that level so i have to be fair they've they <laughs> they've stuck to their guns on that one but voluntarily you can't decarbonize different sectors of the economy it'll it'll never work you can only do that by mandating a completely different set of standards and one of the quickest ways of doing that rather than changing laboriously changing all the regulations is by um, imposing a mandatory um price for carbon as our principal external so um We've explored, you know, we have our conversation around hope. <laughs> We've explored quite a few of um, the real challenges that there are if, if we want to, to retain uh, hope. I want to take a couple of further angles on that. The first is, um, I remember from your book launch, that looking to the future, you, you felt that, you know, faced with the intractability of some of these problems, you were yourself um drawn more compellingly uh, back to models of non-violent direct action um and i i wonder in in the the four year, the nearly four years that have um uh passed since that that day what what kind of form that has taken where your interest has gone if there's any been any further evolution of perspective on that because of course, if business can only go as fast as government, government can only go as fast as the people who put them in place. Yeah, indeed. Um, yeah, so my current kind of portfolio is now basically, basically um, politics, Green Party, um, again, prospects for getting four MPs elected this time for real and not just bullshitting. I think that's a, a real possibility. Um, I'm very involved with some of these young direct action campaigners. Um, if I'm being honest, my support for direct action tends to be channeled through working with them and supporting them in the in initiatives they're taking. Um, I put my, I don't know how many of you have been following this debate about the amazing Trudy Warner, who is uh, this uh, incredible woman who um, was about to be charged with contempt of court for holding up a sign saying that jurors have an absolute right to acquit defendants on the basis of their conscience. And some, some one of the more reactionary judges in the UK had decided that represented a contempt of court and the attorney general in his wisdom, decided that he was right and they were going to prosecute um, Trudy and she could have faced a jail sentence of two years. Well, I was one of the people who said, if you're going to prosecute Trudy, you're going to have to prosecute me at the same time because upholding the rights of people to protest and to explain to a jury while they're doing it seemed to me to be pretty bloody basic. Anyway, to my great relief, yesterday, Another judge said, the Attorney General is off his trolley. You obviously can't prosecute this woman for holding up a sign, the words of which appear on the wall of the Old Bailey mm -hmm. and have been there for decades as an expression of the minimum rights of people acting as jurors. So I took a deep sigh and a bit of relief and thought, thank God, okay, that one's gone. I don't have to worry about that. Um, but I'm 
I'm making light of it. It's not, it's not that I, I don't make light of it. It's really important. I just know that there are things I need to do in terms of my professional commitments at the moment, which make it difficult to join in some of those actions. But the direction of travel for me, even if I haven't got a theory of change, I've certainly got a direction of travel, mm. leads ineluctably down that path. Um, so it's, you know, it just seems inevitable somewhere along the line. I'm 73, for God's sake. If I can't get myself properly arrested now, it's going, what's the, when, when is it going to happen? If if you do get arrested um, and you have access to Wi-Fi, uh, <laughs> it would be great to, to have a follow-up to our conversation, <laughs> even if your background is um, less homely looking. Um, on that inevitability topic, though, I, I wanted to take a, a, another angle. And this is one that does give me um, cause for concern, actually. Um, so, I mean, of course, all the whole co conversation is, of course, for concern. But in terms of read, reading your book, um, your book is heavily focused on mitigation. Uh, and of course, the worse things get, the more action on mitigation becomes important because of the danger of multiple tipping points. So, you know, the worse things get, it's not a question of doing less on mitigation because every single action we do probably translates mm. into a bigger difference for human well-being in the, the worst the scenario. Um, having said that, I have a lot of, it happened to have done a lot of work with international in disasters and emergencies, the humanitarian sector and so on. And it is also important just to deal with the realities that are. Um, we had a, an exchange earlier in the year with Gaia Vince, for example, who says, also advocates strongly for effective mitigation. Um, but she also believes we need to be really realistic on climate and that as things stands, it looks like extremely destructive temperature rises are happening. Um, and she cites data to suggest that for every degree of average global temperature rise, we could see approximately a billion climate refugees um, and advocates quite strongly for a, a climate realism where we put a lot of attention on working out, OK, given the inevitable reality of the climate emergency, what do how do we respond in a sensible way? And so in actually coming to terms with that, you know, she advocates looking at very ambitious mechanisms for working out how you handle a massive increase in global migration, how you look at where the completely changed landscape of economic opportunities are, where it's possible to create new cities, where um, the changing climate patterns actually might make some things possible that weren't previously possible, that we need to think about organising ourselves in an ambitiously different way to somehow make the most of a situation that is imp is imposed on us, you know, to to what degree, you know, in a sense, is there a risk when we focus on such simplistic things, such as the race, seemingly simplistic targets, such as the race to net zero, that we overlook some of the broader, more complex need to build resilience, and can you know ultimately overlook the sharp end of where people are going to come up against the climate emergency, no matter what. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I've never seen the mitigation agenda and the adaptation agenda as being mutually exclusive. I've never understood that. It just seems to me to demonstrate a complete misunderstanding of how international uh, politics uh, works, how the UN works and all the rest of it. Actually, budgets for adaptation internationally are improving all the time. Climate finance has been a bit of a tricky business, but we are now reaching around 100 billion in climate finance a year, a commitment we made in 2009, and we've eventually got there. Um, it took quite a lot of time. So I'm absolutely committed to the idea that we must, must focus now globally on these adaptation challenges, because we are talking about the lives of already tens of millions of people being devastated by the existing level of climate change. 
So I don't see this as an either or job, but uh, uh, Guy and I have argued about this. I, I, we share exactly the same analysis of what is going to happen. I'm publishing a paper um, in the middle of May on what we're going to do about the one uh, about the one billion forcibly displaced people by 2050. That was once an outlier of an idea. Now it's becoming the figure, one billion forcibly displaced people by 2050, around which an awful lot of scientists are beginning to cluster, um, people like Tim Lenton and others. Gaia has this solution that we could then somehow change, transform the world by accommodating uh, hundreds of millions of refugees in those countries that are not as directly affected by climate change as that equatorial belt. I am a realist, first and foremost, and I can trust, you have to trust me on this, there is literally no way that politics in rich world countries today will ever countenance, ever countenance that kind of open border approach to dealing with what will be the greatest humanitarian disaster the world has ever seen by a massive, massive uh, proportion. So I think about this very differently. I'm looking at the rights that we need to um, bring forward for officially designated climate refugees. I'm looking at the ways we need to enhance the uh, adaptation spending through things like the Bridgetown Initiative. I'm looking at a host of different ways in which it's possible for people not to have to flee from their countries, maintain what we can of opportunities for them in those countries. It means a huge transfer of wealth Paul, yeah. from the rich world to the poorer world, huge transfer of wealth. But um, yeah, Guy and I do not see eye to eye on migration being part of the answer to adaptation. Hmm. Mm -hmm. It doesn't work for me, I can tell you. Not because I, mean, yeah. I don't support it myself, but when I look at the politics of what's going to happen and you wait till the European election on June the 5th and you watch what happens when far right parties in Europe increase their group in the European Parliament by anywhere between 40 to 50 new far right MEPs. And that's on the basis of totally manageable levels of migration today. The fuss. These, the levels of migration to Europe today, are, uh, just they're almost irrelevant. Mm. They're so easy to deal with if we had sensible politicians and sensible policy. Chris Arnold. Right, I'm back on now. Um, yeah, I was going to ask you a question because sitting where called marketing, <clears throat> do you think that um, advertising and marketing is part of the problem or part of the solution? <laughs> <laughs> That's a loaded question today. I wondered whether that was going to come up today. Um, <laughs> it, 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 you have to think about this stuff generically. So the role of the advertising industry globally is a massively powerful one. Uh, many of those agencies that work for very large companies um, don't have a second thought about the degree to which those companies are contributing to a sustainable future on planet Earth or undermining it. Um, I suspect that if I was to do a calculation of the total percentage of total advertising and marketing spend that is actually seeking to secure better conditions for humankind in the future, it would be less than 5%. So for me, in the round, advertising and marketing is a profoundly problematic and destructive global industry. That doesn't mean to say there aren't brilliant people in those professions working hard to try and change that around. But right now, you look at the scale of it it ain't helping i i have to agree with that and i think if you look at the the publication of the green claims code i mean that has come out of an enormous amount of lying and that was a partnership between agencies and clients which was very complicit uh, especially for the bigger agencies who seem to be very complicit in basically giving the client what they want if they want to lie I know a lot of the smaller consultancies myself being included you know when we're trying to advise clients honestly they'd rather they don't really want truth makers yep. in those rooms. You know, they're scared of us almost. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's a very good book, which I'm sure some of you have heard of, called Badvertising. Yeah. By mm -hmm. Andrew Sims and a couple yeah. of colleagues. And it's, uh, it'll, it'll really annoy you. It'll, it, I think it annoys everybody who reads it. But it is a really, it's a really spiky little provocative reminder that there's no free pass for marketing and advertising in today's world. You're on the same hooks as 
everybody else. Yeah, thanks. I wonder, um, I'd like, like to go to, to Neil next. <clears throat> Do you feel on the hook, Neil? <laughs> Yes, no, I mean, I, uh, I'm interested in connected issues. To me, there are a lot of conversations in big business today around three topics. One, sustainability, the other, AI, um, and finally, cybersecurity. And the World Economic Forum are talking about all of these things as well. And I'm going off to speak at a conference about AI tomorrow in Barcelona. Um, and I was just... But, at the same point, they're raising the issues like if we're relying on AI, that's going to use a lot of energy to feed the servers, mm. which nobody's really talking about. Uh, you mentioned also the whole thing about political influence. And then there's cybersecurity, which is one of the biggest risks, because as we become data, every business becomes a data business. Mm. Cybersecurity is being used to manipulate things, the European uh, elections, etc. And we can never be really true. What we're hearing or seeing is actually actually the the right thing so yeah i was just wondering kind of like you know what exposure or or, or um uh ideas you had around the connecting or influence of cybersecurity and ai uh to our our mission for sustainability and climate change and then the final one was a bit more fun i had a, a podcast by professor brian cox last week and he said that every new leader should be sent up into space to actually see the world from space to realize how fragile the world they were looking after actually is. So with that, those are my questions. Yeah, slightly carbon intensive way of educating our world leaders. But nonetheless, <laughs> I, get what he's, um, I get what he's on about. And he's right. Um, I, I look, look, I. What do I think about this? I think that. I think our lives are heading into such a troubled period that AI is just going to compound many of those difficulties. And in a post-truth world, the ability of people who do not share the desire for a better world for the whole of humankind will be able to manipulate almost every single aspect of communications to the detriment of those who depend on some kind of integrity in our media and so on. So I get, I get quite depressed when I think about AI. Um, I don't let's not start talking about it. there's going to be an AI upside. I remember at the start of the, sustain, of the climate debate, people said, oh, well, there'll be an upside to climate change because they'll be able to go grow wheat in, in the Arctic. Isn't that wonderful? And I feel the same way when I hear people say there's going to be a fantastic set of upsides from AI, and I think there probably are. But if you look at who's going to be making the money from AI and the ways in which AI will transform our lives, that's my test. Who gets, who gets the money from all of this? And the people who get the money from AI seem to me to be the people who've helped to lay waste any kind of civilized sense of what society should be working to achieve already. I'm no great fan of the tech titans out there today. In fact, I think they're a bunch of global criminals. Yeah, uh, my particular take on AI is that one of the things that will be very important to explore is whether AI improves or degrades the quality of of public conversations you uh, know the answer to that question paul <clears throat> there's literally no point posing it you know what it will do in that regard i've certainly been burned previously because i was one of many people who hoped that um social media and increased connectivity would improve uh a, a bit and it has of course improved our ability to to cooperate but it has also been a major part of creating the conditions for a more polarized uh world um and i am concerned about the the speed and power of algorithms that may take um a distorted uh narrative and and take it yeah, yeah. instantly um, as we're a little low on time, Jonathan, should we take a couple more comments? Yeah, and take two together, together and then we can in, wrap in it the up. Round. So, so let's go to, we've got three hands raised. Let's see if we can get through all of those in, in time. So, Suleiman, can we go relatively quickly? Oh, <clears throat> thank you very much, Paul um, and then Jonathan, for the um, this very important issue. So the question I was given was, the, given the urgency urgent of the um, climate change and especially the, the, the ongoing wars, the global like instability, how that can make an impact, like for example, mitigating or tackling the uh, climate issues um, and how the future look like if the, the current situation we see the globally 
can continue. So, and then the, the politics or army trade overtake the, our attention instead of uh, climate justice and climate change in, in more work. Thank you. So, Kirsty? Um, so you talk a lot about truth and uh, your connection with the Green Party um, might be an avenue for this. I have never understood why politics is not covered under the Advertising Standards Authority <laughs> the same way that any other advertising is. Surely that is a quick win to truth um, and upholding truth um, across politics. That's also one that hopefully, Kirsty, you'll come to our event in July with Mike and uh, and Lord Deben. Yeah. Um, brilliant question. Um, Marcus, shall we add your question and then we'll get Jonathan's take on everything? Thank you. Uh, I'll, try, yeah, I'll try and keep it brief. Um, there's, there's a few voices being raised uh, now around the idea of, of degrowth as an alternative to this constant obsession that the world seems to still have with um, GDP growth as the answer to everything. And I think you touched on this um, earlier. And um, and I just thought in connection with this idea that um, that growth can somehow grow us out of the problem, I think is of the climate problem is is slightly ridiculous. But when we consider the well-being of people and planet, I think there's a lot of evidence to suggest now around the work by Richard Le Lord Richard Layard and others in well-being economics that actually a world where um, where there is more stability and slower growth and importantly more equality and um less of a disparity between rich and poor where you know right now we people praise capitalism for certain achievements but there's still three thousand people who are who, who who own more money than the poorest 45 billion which is really utterly ridiculous and so i wonder what your thoughts are around degrowth whether you can point me to any other leaders lead, leading thinkers in that area um and um, and and I suppose my point is is that actually the solution for the planet is also the solution for the people when we get lower growth and greater equality across the world. Yeah, I will just quickly preface that you might also look up our exchange with Professor Tim Jackson uh, on. I read his book. Uh, yeah, prosperity without growth. Very good. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, Jonathan, a, a few simple questions to address this week. <laughs> As we wrap up. <laughs> yeah. Well, I can start with Kirsty's first of all, because that's it, it would be absolutely wonderful if politics was bound by the same rules. The fact that the BBC now has to employ more and more people in a specially designated unit to determine what constitutes something resembling truth and what doesn't tells us where we are in this regard. But interestingly, very strict limits have been set around what they can expose to this analysis. They're not allowed to say that politician is lying because that would obviously bring them into a great deal of trouble with the government. So now I'm complete with you on that. The trouble is politicians now have, have feel they can lie with impunity. I mean, I, I'm not gonna blame all of this on Donald Trump, but you know the lie count for him. He's, I think in, the, in one week when he notched up was it 900 lies in one week as president? And I think that was his record week. And Trump has sort of given permission in a weird kind of way for politicians just to be more and more duplicitous. So I'd love it, but uh, it ain't gonna happen, Kirsty. Sorry about that. No politician is gonna pass that law, I can tell you. Um, the degrowth story, if I can come to that very quickly, is fascinating. Another guy you might want to um, uh, have a look at, uh, Marcus, is um, Jason Hickel who has written really well about degrowth, because what he points out is that there's an enormous difference between, between a, 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 a degrowth strategy where we move away from our over-dependence on growth into, as you said, a much more balanced prioritizing of things like care, community, health, well-being, all of that. And you bring forward that different kind of portfolio of what it is that makes life good for people. But that's a very different thing from enforced poverty where because your economy is lurching into a lack of economic growth, because as we've pointed out before, rich world countries are finding it harder and harder to um, get the growth story going. If that's 
how people interpret degrowth, then it's a really difficult thing for politicians to entertain. So the word degrowth is problematic from a signaling point of view, because it, it says to people, growth is bad, and so we've got to have degrowth, as in no growth, so you're going to be poorer than you were before. That is not a good starting point for any political discussion with anybody under the sun. So I'm a little bit nervous about the degrowth language. I'm very supportive of what is happening. And by the way, um, Paul, you mentioned Tim Jackson, his new book, which he is, um, I hope, going to be bringing out later this year, is called The Care Economy. Mm. And it is all about reprioritizing what an economy should deliver, starting with conditions of care through health, better education, community, well-being, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so watch out for that one. I guess that takes us finally to the weird world we live in, where, um, where yes, I think the latest count is 2,822 billionaires. Um, we're now, the race is on, for those of you who track this stuff carefully, for who is going to be the world's first trillionaire. It seems almost impossible that people would give serious attention to that, but that is the way the global economy works. If you've got assets, those assets create conditions for increased wealth through the use of those assets, even if you don't do a day's work in your entire life. Okay, so that brings me to the point, Suleiman, about war. You sometimes would be persuaded that the world we live in now is engaged in a series of massive distractions from the core reality that affects the whole of humankind. And I'm deeply concerned about what is happening because all the conditions at the moment in the world today, security conditions, are just taking away all the available political leadership to focus on this uh, existential crisis about climate change. So I am very, very concerned about that. Um, which I'm going to end with a sort of paradoxical, I love paradox. In fact, I don't know whether it's possible to be hopeful about life without paradox. So the paradox I live in is that things have got to get a great deal worse before they can begin to get better. And I do mean a great deal worse. And that has to happen as fast as possible because we need that additional pain in the system, particularly pain that afflicts really rich people we need all of that additional pain in the system just as fast as possible to avoid what would in fact be massive, traumatic dislocation for humankind as a whole in the future. So I spend quite a lot of time dreaming about the destruction of Miami through a superstorm coming in off the Atlantic as a consequence of increased average surface ocean temperatures during the winter if you look at the conditions that is creating for a mega storm sweeping in off the Atlantic, I have already suggested to the powers that be that there is no better place for that storm to impact than to destroy Miami, which would in turn completely destroy the American insurance industry, which would in turn destroy the global reinsurance industry, which would make an awful lot of people sit up and think, oh my God, that's what it looks like. Yeah, is that course. painful enough? Yeah, it would course. be for people living in Miami, but yeah. they don't deserve. Oh, sorry, I find it difficult to be charitable towards citizens of Miami. It, um, it there are parts of the world where home insurance is now more than the mortgage. Um, I was being, I was being, I hope, sort of irreverent about it, but honestly, the insurance industry is heading towards the first big bust in the global capital system, and it'll happen in the next two to three years. Yeah. Um, so you've handled all of those questions and, and landed us <laughs> at the time that, that we, I mean, what a, it, it, it shows the sort of um, seemingly effortless competence of having had all of those leadership positions for, for so long. Um, you know, so I've I've recommend for anyone who hasn't read it. I've both read this and listened to the audio book. Um, but um, Jonathan, this afternoon has felt like an opportunity to watch over your shoulder as you write the updated version of the book. <laughs> um, so uh, we could not be uh, more more grateful um, for anyone on the in the group or or, or watching or listening to a, a replay who would like more of this kind of conversation, who would like to have the opportunity to work with their 
heroes such as Jonathan and some of the people that we've talked about today to build a track record of positive impacts on, on these issues through our Coffee with a Cause sessions where we support the growth strategy or the impact strategy of important charities and social enterprises and to be a part of a community of people helping each other become more honest and more purposeful in our leadership roles, then please do consider joining us at Marketing Kind, www.marketingkind.org. Brief mention of some forthcoming gatherings. So our next Your Marketing Kind will be on May 2nd with our own member, um, Arunjay Katakam, who will be talking about his book that continues today's theme. His recent book is Generation Hope, which was endorsed by Yanis Varoufakis, among others. Um, our next digital fireside is with another of our members, Mark Evans, former managing director of marketing and digital at Direct Line Insurance Group. Um, would be very interesting. He'll be discussing life after the big job on May 14th. Um, of interest to many of our members pursuing portfolio careers where they're trying to be change makers in their different roles. Um, and our next Coffee with a Cause is also Jonathan themed. Um, we heard you, Jonathan, talk recently about uh, the banking sector and the need for greener investment. So our next Coffee with a Cause is with a charity called Bank.Green on May 21st. Um, yesterday, Bank.Green launched a green league table showing the ranking of all UK banks so that you can find out if your bank and so your money is funding fossil fuels or the transition to a more sustainable future. And if you're not happy with your bank's ranking, you can easily find a better one to switch to. So hopefully we will see people there. And once again, uh, Jonathan, thank you on behalf of everyone. And, and for me, this was uh, one of the most rewarding hours of, of my year or several years um, uh, so far. And I'm very grateful that you were willing to join us. No, thank you. It's been a lovely conversation. Thank you very much. And thanks to everyone for attending. Thank you. Thank you.